Uh, thank you all very much for joining us here this evening for the 2020 CIW lecture. Uh, my name is Jane Golly. I'm the director of the Australian Centre on China in the World. And I would like to formally begin this evening's event by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the many lands on which we meet today. Uh, where I am here in Canberra, that's Ngunnawal Nambri country. I recognise their continuing connection to the land across this ancient continent now called Australia. And I also acknowledge that they represent the oldest living culture. I pay my respect to their elders and leaders, past, present and emerging. And I also extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. It really is an honour for me to introduce Professor Louise Edwards to give the 2020 CIW lecture. Um, my only regret being that I'm not introducing her to all of you in person at CIW, where of course this event would have been held in normal times. Uh, Professor Edwards is a Scientia Professor of Chinese History at UNSW in Sydney, and also an Honorary Professor at Hong Kong University. Over her academic career spanning three decades, uh, according to my count, she has published close to 80 journal articles and book chap chapters, along with 17 books. Her most recent sole authored book, which was published this year, is called Citizens of Beauty, Drawing Democratic Dreams in Republican China. I reckon that sounds pretty appealing, but if that's not quite your thing, maybe women warriors and wartime spies of China or women politics and democracy is. I'm gonna be picking up at least one of those for the beach uh, this summer. <laughs> Louise uh, has many bows uh, of, of achievement in that long career. She's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities and the Academy of Social Sciences, as well as the Hong Kong Academy of Humanities. She served as the president of the Asian Studies Association of Australia and is currently, and I believe a long-term member of or on the Council of the Chinese Studies Association of Australia, where I have experienced her giving and giving over the time that I've had, had a chance to get to know her. It's especially pleasing that Louise is giving this annual lecture as it's my understanding that it will be her last public lecture as professor at UNSW prior to her retirement in a couple of weeks time. Uh, given her lifetime work on gender, I'm also thrilled that it is Louise who is the one to break the female drought in this lecture series. Uh, and I'm pretty a little bit embarrassed about that, but delighted that uh, it will be Louise speaking first. I've had the pleasure of hearing her before, and I know that she'll set a very high bar for those women and also the men that will follow. Uh, but this evening, Professor Edwards is not here to talk to us about women specifically, although I'm assuming that they'll feature. Um, she's here on another, I think, equally important topic, uh, and particularly at this point in our history, and that is Australia's relationship with Asia and how our current crisis with China that seems to go from bad to worse almost daily uh, reflects deeper problems in Australia's engagement with Asia and Asian Australians. Just two quick points before I pass over. First, um, given the large numbers and the time constraints, I would ask that if you have questions, uh, you use the chat function on Zoom and I will channel those to Louise uh, at the end of her speaking time. Uh, and secondly, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, Kim Yang, mm -hmm. who has worked really hard to put this event together as she has on so many other occasions during her six years at CIW, which come to an end today. So thank you, Kim, uh, for today and for everything you've done for CIW. Uh, and over to you, Professor Louise Edwards. Okay, well, that is just the loveliest welcome. Thank you, um, thank you, Jane. And, and also thanks to Kim for coming in on your, on your final, final day. So I hope this all goes smoothly so that you can celebrate a smooth uh, culmination of your amazing work at China and the World Centre. So, um, Thank you to the China and the World Centre, but also thank you to all of you for Zooming in and a special welcome to the participants at the Australian National University's Asia Pacific Week, which is a really wonderful week. And I, I, I guess you're all missing out the face-to-face -face interactions, but I really hope you're still having a great, um, a great time at the, um, uh, at nonetheless. Um, Australia's relations with Asia appear to be stuck in a time machine. And the time machine's moving backwards, whether it be our mainstream media, our politicians, our public servants, our art sector, or our universities. 
many leaders seem to be labouring under the misconception that Australians are all white and that we all hail from Liverpool, Limerick or London. Now, in an apparent inability to actually see the population of this country in all its full glory of languages, religions, colours, classes, they nod occasionally to the ethnic communities with multilingual adverts in times of crisis, but the ethnics are kind of represented as problems. They need special language and they need special cultural attention and sometimes, well, we'll grudgingly apply, um, comply. Australia's overall vision of the Asia Pacific region is currently similarly dismal. We're part of the Five Eyes Intelligence Gathering Group, US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. But the Australian eyes are stricken with this resurgence of post-war amblyopia. It's commonly known as wandering eyes. So lots of children are born with wandering eyes. It usually corrects itself in adolescence, but not in our case. We know, that, that we know this to be amblyopia because many of our bosses continue to lead us with one eye on London and one eye on LA. And what are the mouths that are accompanying these eyes? They appear to have only one tongue and it only speaks English. And the ears, well, they appear to be pretty hard of hearing despite all their sophisticated hearing aids. Now that would be fine. It would be completely fine if all the best ideas and the most innovative policy was produced in English, but it isn't. Look at the amazing pandemic planning and policy prep that Taiwan did, and we saw it being rolled out when COVID hit. And that would be fine if most business and military strategies and secrets were whispered in English, but they aren't. You know, they're happening in myriad languages, including those in the rich family of Chinese languages. So this comes, this current mess that we're in, comes despite decades of pretty successful engagement with Asia, forging complex di um, diplomatic relations with communist nations like China and Vietnam, performing peacekeeping operations in uh, Timor leste election monitoring in Cambodia, for free trade agreements with an ever-expanding list of nations in the region. But Australia's current policy debate discussion and politics appears to have returned to an old style village-like insularity, watching out for threats the outsider might pose to the status quo, gossiping about their strange habits, raising eyebrows when they speak their lingo and chuckling with their accent of English. And then we turn inwards again, anxiously managing our chronic amblyopia, eyes that wander between LA and London. Now, it seems to me that one of the problems is that we're not used to being weaker than, poorer than, less influential than Asians, particularly Chinese. I think we have a race problem in our key institutions that manage our narratives and control our policies. Many Australian lead in, in Australian leadership still seem to imagine themselves doing some kind of trickling down of expertise or superior raw materials into the hands of a grateful developing people up north. Our Asia literacy courses need a serious revamp and they need to be delivered to a new bunch of leaders. And a you know, trigger warning for all academics here, we need some new learning outcomes to be aligned with new course objectives. So Asia generally, and China in particular, has changed. Our national public Asia literacy curriculum hasn't kept up. We fancy ourselves to be skilled up, but our current leaders are showing serious symptoms of what you know, Michael Wesley is called insular internationalism. It's a, toy, a term he coined to describe the complacent Australian who confidently thinks that they've got Asia. And that, yep, that was true, but Asia's moving pretty fast and we are not keeping up. Our, at least our current leader, um, leaders don't seem to comprehend just how fast Asia is transforming. But the other thing that's happening is that Australia has changed. And the audience for this talk, you know, if you could see each other, and you, maybe some of you can, is a case in point. But if you wander into any school or any university, and you will see that change. London and Liverpool are still here, but there's also Luxor and Lanzhou. You know, it is a very different place now, Australia. So times have changed around us, even if our national imaginary is currently dominated by Orientalist visions of white people patronising poor brown people and telling them what to do. You know, we've all been on those delegations or tourist trips where there's some embarrassing Australian starts telling the local Asian how to run their lab, their class, their farm, their country. And these Australian heroes have no knowledge of the behind the scenes, softly, softly work that goes into patching up these awkward exchanges, sotto voce, just to keep the Australian show in China and Asia on the road. Well, no more sotto voce. We need to call out these poor performers because they are becoming more and more harmful to Australia as the wealth and power balances change in the world. Somehow there are 
I don't know how it happens, but somehow there are still lots of people around in positions of authority in Australia that imagine that Australia is giving Chinese and Asians more generally the benefit of our supposed superior learning and skills and, you know, a bit of iron ore on the side. Well, it's time to open their eyes and ears and tell them how to learn from Asia. Now, to be fair, many of these people in leadership positions are adult migrants. They themselves haven't benefited from our Asia literacy programs in schools and universities. But, you know, a whole bunch of others are just racist, yellow peril, fear and greed types, or they're sitting awkwardly in the polite racism of a us and them orientalism. Now, as most of you here today know, much of Asia is rich, powerful, and it doesn't have to put up with being patronised anymore. And China's definitely in that mode. Now, in the past few years, I've had the real pleasure of teaching an, a remarkable group of students at UNSW in a course called Australia's Asian Context. And I realise that UNSW is considered rather special in the higher education realms for the racial composition of its students. And apparently uh, at the University Games, the acronym for UNSW is jokingly transformed into You Never See Whites. And apart from the fact that this isn't true, I mean, like, most of Australian universities, the management is 99% white and most hail immediately or a generation back just from the UK, you know, an Anglo diaspora. But there are also non-Asian students at UNSW. However, generally speaking, walking around UNSW is, gen is very much like walking around Hong Kong University, where I had the pleasure, as Jane said, of teaching back in the 2010s. Asian faces abound all sorts of varieties, East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, Middle Easterners, and then all kinds of mixed race people are in there too. But unlike in Hong Kong, the Asian students in Australia are acutely aware of the constraints that being Asian has on their lives, on their careers, and on their prospects. They are very clear headed about the limitations of their progress and the narrow pathways to success that are easy for them that are, and that lie ahead. And a lot of these revolve around finance and IT, sort of acceptable places for Asians in Australia's large institutions. You know, and why is, this, why is it acceptable for these people, for Asians to be in these roles? Because it's perceived that they won't threaten to change the culture of an institution. They'll just do as they're instructed. They're just providers of technical skills. All the direction, the strategy, the creative thinking, well, that'll come from the Anglo diaspora. Now, one of the features of the Australian leaders who are pumped up with their Five Eyes authority is that they, they are frequently monolinguals. But even more problematically, they don't even have a multilingual consciousness. And by the latter, I mean that it is possible for people to, who, who only have one language to have some kind of understanding about how this limits them, how the appreciation of the language labour that others are undertaking in communicating with them in their one language and how maybe it's even just as simple as understanding how to work with an interpreter or a translator. Many of our leaders have neither multilingualism or multilingual consciousness and hence we have the slashing and burning of foreign language and culture courses in universities in recent decades. You know, they're too expensive. Uh, this, we need it for the lab, right? Um, these same leaders are too proud, well, maybe I should be nicer and say they're too busy to learn a language other than English. They don't want to be the ones taking risks with their status, making the grammar uh, mistakes, the vocab errors, the mispronunciations, the funny accents. They don't want to be groping for words. This attitude seems to be, you know, well, okay, we'll just pull in a few language lackeys to do some translation and interpreting and she'll be right. So you don't have to alter the institutional culture. You don't reform the foundations of policy. You don't tweak your ear to listen in a different way. You just get the language techies to do it. You know, you get them to do the interpreting translation IT, just like you get the uh, uh, Asian information technology IT geeks to do the, um, do the, um, the technology. It's just words, right? You slot in one word, press translate, and another one, a weird one, pops out. You know, the Commonwealth Government's Department of Home Affairs um, use of um, Google Translate for some of the COVID advice just shows how and how wrong it was, um, just shows how close the step from language techie to AI techie is in the heads of the one tongue mob. Well, my students are not thrilled about this. They're creative, multilingual, innovative, energetic, empathetic, globally aware, and unless they get invited to the heart of the organisational policy making, agenda setting, 
and actually genuinely listen to while they're there, I feel that they will take their great ideas and head out of Australia up to Asia, where they will be heard and where their cross-cultural skills will be valued rather than ignored. The resilience that these kids have, these young people have, is quite remarkable. And some of it comes from their um, uh, experience in their families as being translators, um, cultural negotiators, managers of bureaucracy for adult migrants' uh, parents and adult migrant grandparents. They have an amazing array of soft skills that just make them so precious in this current world that we live in. But, you know, maybe sending them up to Asia is okay because we're all a one human race and it's a pretty small planet. You know, and historically, the nation state might be well on the way to running its course. But, you know, it's a real pity if we let some of the best and brightest culturally astute people leave Australia. We risk making this nation even more vulnerable and irrelevant to the big forces shaping the world than it already is. Now, Australia will potentially feature, um, uh, mimic a feature that my colleague Sally McLaren notes about Japan. It's a nation whose entrenched institutionalized sexism has the curious side effect of providing the world with a pool of highly talented women working at the upper echelons of international organizations like the ILO, the World Food Programme, UNHCR, UNICEF. You know, Australia's highly talented and energetic young Asians will brush the dust of crusty white Australia off the bottom of their shoes burn some sandalwood incense to dispel the stench of stupidity that Australia's amblyopia is currently producing and head up to Asia. Now, I, current, I, I hope that the current trickle of expertise to our near north that's already occurring doesn't become a flood. I hope that the amazing work that's taking place in Australian schools, universities and community organisations that has produced these globally aware, culturally sensitive, fabulous folk under 40 will be brought to benefit Australia's large institutions and that they will be welcome to influence our policy direction within these institutions. You know, ethnic Chinese students fill our language classrooms because they know that adding German and French to their mastery of English and Chinese is useful. They know that adding Korean and Japanese is going to really, you know, knock the socks off their, their lives. You know, it's going to make their lives so much richer as well as um, profitable if you want to even go down the utilitarian route. So my feeling is that these people in their 20s and their 30s are Australia's May 4th new culture generation. We need to facilitate the shifts that they can propel for our nation and the globe, not block them. They have really fresh ideas and new perspectives. And I, for one, do not want to be that old, crusty scholar trying to bring back the Qing Dynasty imperial examination system when there's the possibility of a May 4th cosmopolitanism, curiosity and open-mindedness on the horizons. But that day's yet to come. Um, at the moment, these young Asian Australians find themselves without a public space in which to pass critical comment, um, well, not easily anyway, uh, expressions of discontent about the way Australian institutions, workplaces or systems, often dominated as they are by the Anglo diaspora, are ignored with a how very dare you kind of eyebrow raise, or from the bogan end of the conversation comes abusive epithets like Australia, if you don't love it, leave it, or I grew here, you flew here. Now, you know, this is not good enough. Australia desperately needs what Joe Lo Bianco has described as voice democracy. He uses this term, voice democracy, within his framework of linguistics, human right, linguistic human rights and language justice. And he's demonstrated over and over again how multilingualism and language rights are crucial for community building at both the local and national levels at, across mul multiple global case studies, and including some in some pretty awful war zones. So he's argued long and hard about the rights of all peoples to access services and education in their own languages in Australia. And he's demonstrated time and again that in providing such services, multiple benefits accrue to the broader, broader economy and the broader community. Australia's Asian diaspora come with a wealth of languages, just as the post-war European migrants did as well. We need to build workplaces that see these language skills as assets. We need an immigration program that doesn't jeopardize the multilingualism that we can benefit from. We need to have a migration of people from countries other than English. We're currently sending skilled labor back to Asia because the new English language tests for various visa categories and pathways to citizenship are looking like the dictation tests in the white Australia policy days. 
many of my students, they are working in hospitality, right? They're heading up kitchens, they work in front of house, they're working in the bars. They, uh, you know, they, they're doing the whole gamut in hospitality and they see the world. They see a lot of the world in those jobs. And like a lot of employers and workers, they've lost good staff, great colleagues because of this fixation with English that's manifested in many of our policies and, dis and decisions. Now, an expert Korean chef gave, gave up her permanent residency process and heads home because she failed an English grammar test despite her employers wanting her to stay on and despite her English capacities being more than sufficient to succeed in her industry. Women like this chef are not drains on the Australian taxpayer. They're bringing their skills along with their imperfect grammar and their funny accents to this nation. And their multilingualism and rich perspective on the world could set us up for getting on board with the, or even building the latest new food sensation that will help our farmers and manufacturers build wealth and trade into China, Japan and Korea and elsewhere. Well, that possibility has gone. God forbid Australia doesn't want a chef that can't get her grammar perfect. But I'll hang on a minute. If you hold a passport from the UK, USA, New Zealand, Canada, Republic of Ireland, no, Republic of Ireland's not one of the five eyes, but if you hold one of those passports, you don't need to have proof of English competency for any of the visas. And I suppose they let the um, Department of Home Affairs let the Republic of Ireland people in to the one tongue team because they, you know, if you've got she Seamus Haney and Anne Enright, well, it's a bit of a slam dunk in terms of your English language proficiency, isn't it? But, you know, back to Joe's notion of voice democracy. I want us to extend his idea to include the recognition of the importance of really listening to non-white Australians when they engage in public debates in English. If employers or institutions really want graduates with critical thinking skills, innovation and initiative, then they themselves must develop the critical listening skills as well. Not the marketing and spin affairs of the fake town halls and listening exercises that many of us are subjected to in the university sector, we need our leaders to change the batteries on their hearing aids and really, really, really listen. Alter the governance structures so there's really some possibility of communication from the bottom and the middle to the top. Many universities now run on hierarchical lines that even the CCP would be impressed by. Our governance structures look remarkably like democratic centralism, where there's more of the centralism and less of the democracy. A classic example of how far behind the game we are was provided by the recent Senate inquiry into matters affecting the diaspora communities. The terms of reference implied that it was a committee that was concerned about the needs of diaspora. And most of all of the submissions were delivered, you know, in good faith around those terms of reference. You know, Sudanese community groups, Vietnamese community groups, Uyghurs, Chinese, Italians, Indians, anti-racist groups, Multicultural Youth Australia, they all joined in as well as in good faith as well as you know, broad-based welfare, religious, and you know, and non um, you know non-ethnically oriented groups like um, the state libraries and the Academy of Humanities in Australia. Now, some some of these submissions, people were invited to speak to the senators, and in the process, we learned that we would not really been provided with the full terms of reference. The senators leading the inquiry, or actually, it felt like an inquisition to many people, had an agenda. And these senators appeared, that did most of the speaking, appeared keenly interested in diaspora if they were firstly useful in furthering some race baiting political advantage, like dog whistling to a marginal seat or trashing a premier they didn't like, or secondly, advancing their latest foreign policy objective. And I mean, we have to use the word policy pretty, you know, I'm, I'm using it pretty loosely here because there wasn't a lot of thinking going on. Now, to these senators, I would say, and to those others who are driving our uh, national and institutional narratives more broadly, diaspora are really only heard when they're useful to fulfilling some other agenda. If they express discontent or dissatisfaction, then they're just ungrateful migrants. Non-Anglo diaspora learn very quickly that they have to be expressing constant gratitude for being allowed in. But if you take up the challenge of voice democracy, if you really listen with a multilingual consciousness, then some of these critical comments you might find are really useful. And at the moment, what we see happening is that these you know, critical comments are dismissed as un-Australian, fractious, and their speakers are probably foreign agents. You know, on the first point, the furthering of race baiting, Asians have moved to become less useful for race baiting around things like drugs and crime. 
Um, that was, you know, that was the role they played in the 1990s. You know, sadly, what we see now is that the African communities are being used for that, for that purpose now. But at the inquiry, a representative from the South Sudanese community in Sydney, uh, this amazing person by the name of Dao Item, he made an excellent pushback to the question which ran along the lines of, you know, why are there so many African youth gang problems in Victoria? And his reply was a really pointed one. He said, well, actually, you know, it's because the politicians want there to be an African youth gang prime, um, crime problem in Victoria because you want to get Dan Andrews or you want to win the Victorian election. So he's pointing out that young people, vulnerable young people often, are being sacrificed for a few votes garnered by those who are being encouraged to fear difference. But it's the second point that really relates to the Chinese diaspora, the use of diaspora for foreign policy. And it's it seems that many of the people who had Chinese names in that uh, inquiry in the uh, committee were asked to give opinions on the Chinese Communist Party. They had no interest in it. They, had, they weren't professional or personal interest in the actions of the Chinese Communist Party. They weren't there to talk about the Chinese Communist Party. They were there to talk about the difficulties for Asian Australians to participate in politics, to access services, to be heard without given the how very dare you eyebrow. People like Osman Chiu, Yan Jiang, Wesa Chow, they didn't take this loyalty test lying down, however, and they hit social media expressing disgust at the racist loyalty test that they were subjected to. You know, when you read from other parts of the hearings, it's clear that the, their experience was not an isolated incident. Jane Chin from the Multicultural Youth Adv Advocacy Network faced the same. Professor Waning Sun, one of Australia's leading scholars of di Chinese diaspora studies, was scheduled to speak to the committee in the following week. She withdrew in protest at the uh, abomination that was, that was taking place. Now, Chinese diaspora are often the ones facing foreign policy abuse at the moment. But don't worry, racism is an equal opportunity affair if you're not white. Once your country falls from favour, they'll be targeting your mob next. So it's just the Chinese turn now. Now, I was part of the submission from the Academy of Humanities in Australia, and we were keen to promote um, research that we'd done showing Australia's diaspora advantage, Asian diaspora advantage, you know, brain circulation, ideas circulation, networks um, forming, multilingualism, economic uh, ties, uh, business links, all of this stuff, all these benefits that actually accrue to Australia from having globally connected citizens into China and India in particular. But in fronting the committee, the lead senators were keen to show us that they were concerned about human rights abuses. Well, that sounds pretty good, except they were only concerned about human rights abuses when they occurred in China. Now, what did we all think about the repression of students in Hong Kong by the Hong Kong police? What did we think about the door knocks to parents in Beijing from PRC uh, students studying in Australia? How are we supporting our Hong Kong students in the trauma of Beijing's repression? And what about the internment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang? Now, in this frame, diaspora came to be included, uh, came to include international students and their parents, and even people who haven't or never have will be in Australia. Now, we should be concerned, tr genuinely concerned, about these truly dreadful things that are happening. And I'm really worried about the students protesting in Hong Kong, Bangkok, in France. They re it's really dangerous stuff they're doing, you know, and all power to them. But it is really dangerous, and it shouldn't be used as political football. And there is nothing, nothing short of horror that can, we can feel for when we contemplate the atrocities that are being committed against Uyghurs in Xinjiang. We're witnessing the crushing of a culture and its people in a modern kind of settler colonialism violence that is akin only to that which, you know, which is similar to what Australia went through when uh, modern Australia was being created um, under colonialism. But these kinds of events and atrocities weren't in the terms of reference for this inquiry. Instead, these jailed Hong Kong students and the Uyghurs who were interned in camps were elevated to being worthy of Australian attention because they helped advance the senator's campaign against the People's Republic of China. And I have absolutely no doubt that as soon as these students or internees are no longer useful, they'll be pushed aside in public debate. Once their utility is passed, and should any Hong Kong student or Uyghur manage to enter Australia and pass the one tongue test and dare to complain about some policy, facility or service, then as they become, that is their entitlement as citizens, 
they would likely be ignored or derided as pesky migrants with special needs. You know, don't bring your homeland troubles here. But since you're working in hospitality, go bring me another flat white with an avocado toast while you're at it. So different types of diaspora are useful to our political media and institutional leaders at different times. And some groups don't even get to be called diaspora. You know the ones, the white diaspora which tells me that diaspora is kind of an Australian media for Australian media and policy folk is a term that only refers to non-Anglos. So I'm all up for talking about the Anglo diaspora. There's a lot of them in the ABC and in the universities, far fewer of them in parliament since the section 44 debacle of 2017. But it's interesting that no non-whites fell foul of that constitutional law because they all did their paperwork properly. But on the other hand, there's hardly any of them in there, right? That was Wessa Chow's and Osmond Chill's whole point. So that's why we whiteies of the Anglo diaspora are never suspected of wanting to interfere in Australian politics. We are the politics, the five eyes, the one tongue. We're the mob that can't interfere because we run the joint. We never get asked for a loyalty test, but just try me. I love Australia, but I love it when the silver ferns beat the Australian diamonds in Nepal, and there was not one New Zealand diaspora person who was surprised by the Australian men's cricket team's ball tampering incident, underarm bowling, say no more. And what about Australia's, what about China's incredible success over the last few, de few decades? How is it that Australia's leaders find it so hard to really see or publicly acknowledge the success we can see very clearly the abuse of the Uyghurs and Hong Kong students. And these are dreadful failures of the Chinese state. There is no question. But there have been many successes for the PRC over, the same, over many decades now. And Australians have been major beneficiaries of these uh, economic success of China. As to those, well, we get the occasional pat phrase from our leaders that China is to be commended for lifting millions out of poverty. But that's such old news now that it sounds like a, a kind of a slap down akin to remember where you came from. The fungibility of money, a core principle underpinning economic activity is even impacted by Australia's amblyopia. I sat in a meeting, I kid you not, but I have to say I sat with some qualification because I nearly fell off my chair. A university leader describing success in securing a huge research grant as self-deprecatingly only Chinese money. Wow, wish it had been white money, eh? A dollar in grant money is not a dollar in grant money if it's contaminated by Chineseness, eh what? And we see the same with our international student market, couched in terms of over-dependence on Chinese students. Hmm. Well, I'm pretty tired of hearing these students as described as somehow illegitimate, not real students, not the, the ones we really want. And the COVID border close down was most amusing as all the commentators and university officials were running around saying, see, I told you we shouldn't be so reliant on Chinese students. Well, actually, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, these are all largely COVID free now. And we could open a bubble, you know, travel bubble with these countries and profit mightily from our reliance on Chinese students. That is, if we hadn't done the dumb thing and gone out on a limb with boofhead diplomacy and announced we wanted a COVID inquiry, implying at the same time that China wasn't to be trusted. Then last week, we have the bizarre spectacle of a leading Australian public servant lecturing China about how China shouldn't lecture the world. Really? I mean, pots, kettle, logs, eyes, pool. We're a country the size of a Chinese city. You know, that's, I mean, but this is the month that just keeps giving. Only a couple of days ago, our leaders are demanding an apology from China over a drawing, like a cartoon, for goodness sakes. The statements coming from the Australian Parliament sounded very much like that annoying Chinese refrain, you know, you have hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, you know. But I guess what we can learn from that is that Australian leaders are learning something from China kind of empty rhetoric, but gee, I wish it was when, I was really hoping they'd learn some of the good stuff and not some of this uh, uh, nonsense about cultivated patriotism. You know, Australians being told by their leaders that they need an apology for a drawing. Well, we tell much grimmer jokes around the dinner table, but of course, telling Australians they need an, or deserve an apology is building up the narrative that somehow we have to defend ourselves against China's bullying. 
these cheap shots play to a domestic audience and they jeopardise the most important relationship and strategic shift that Australia has to manage since British colonialism. And I guess I don't need to tell anyone here that governments and leadership groups everywhere, it doesn't matter where you are, what country, what institution, they don't like to be publicly humiliated. They don't like to be laughed at either. And China and the Chinese people are no different from this, but we're used to picking on them as white people, right? That's the whole Orientalist game. But our current leaders seem to be really intent on doing this, you know, shouting taunts across the play field, like, the, you know, the play fields, like the schoolyard buff heads. And what most people, you know, most of us have learned in social interactions with powerful people, course 101, is that you don't make a criticism of a big player in public. You do it privately first. You tell your vice chancellor that his fly is undone before he goes onto the stage. You don't shout it across the auditorium once he's up there. Using this kind of sensible courtesy, it's not specific to our dealings with China, and it's not something you have to go to diplomacy school to, to learn. But with our current crop of leaders, I fear we're now diminishing our middle power status. We're becoming a smaller and nastiest power each time our leaders open their mouths. And who are, and who are we doing it to? the world's biggest economy, a rising military power, and our biggest customer. Wow, good work, trading nation. Another disturbing aspect of, our, of the Asian Australian experience is that generally Asian talent and success is regarded with suspicion. This is why we can't recognize China's uh, success, right? Because it's just done by Asians, so there must be something dodgy about it. But many of my students talk with grim humor about the news headlines they anticipate each year when the um, you know, year 12 ATAR results are coming out. Because success by Asian students is, uh, is queried. You know, somehow working hard, getting extra tutoring, taking studying seriously is seen as kind of illegitimate or cheating. You know, and that, if we did tennis training, music training or swimming training and got extra tutoring or extra coaching, this would not be a problem. But somehow studying, you know, doing too, too well, ooh, it's kind of illegitimate. And then we've got things like the billion dollar industries like K-pop and Asian hip hop. And these are sniffed at often by, as manufactured music or sweatshop stardom, or in some way laughable and not really cool. Asians are after all, not creative, right? They just copy and they follow the rules. And this kind of superiority and blindness to Asian achievement continues to plague our relationship with China. You know, many of my students and millions of people, young people around the world would tell you that this type of music is huge. There's lots of money in it. There's enormous social energy behind it. It's global, it's multilingual, and it's hiring amazing talent from Australia. It's hiring amazing talent from New Zealand, Thailand, Canada, Senegal, Brazil, Belgium. K-pop's not some minor fad from a small half peninsula. It's global and it's big. Asian Australian talent heads up north as scouts pick, pick them up and the Australian music industry is still looking for another hey, true, bloom, you know, that's where we're heading. Our current leader's vision is clouded by an orientalist veil of out of date racial and cultural hierarchies and China's rise means that we need to be very, very, very clearly seeing this nation. We need to lift that orientalist veil we need to draw back those bamboo curtains. I know we want to keep them closed and just peek out every now and then like, you know, the, the village dweller, but we need to open them up to really get our five eyes working properly. And as part of the process, Australians and our leaders need to be clear eyed about ourselves, about our culture and about our people. Knowing how we are perceived around the Asian region is central to building successful relationships there. And Alison Bronowski uh, alerted us to this years ago. Learn how people from other countries see you. What are the stereotypes they're working on? What are, what's going on in their heads when they see and think about Australia? Is it the dumb, drunk, racist tag? Now, if you don't like what you see, then do something about it. At the moment, we see reports from Global Times as evidence of China's craziness. You know, like that Asian chick who speaks up at meetings, you know, doesn't she know she's supposed to be bland, hardworking and a grateful worker. Both China, Japan and Korea have achieved major international reputational rehabs and it didn't take centuries, but it did take a couple of decades. Australia needs an equivalent cultural diplomacy policy of the same magnitude. 
It needs to harness its Australian Asian talent and let these remarkable uh, young people take the lead. And that's uh, an important start. Thank you.